and then uh, 7 p.m. <coughs> Okay, you can please go and call the roll. Mr. Flaris? Who's here? Mr. Bailey? Here. Mr. Commissio? Here. Mr. Conti? Here. Mr. Shea? She's here. Ms. Fahey? Here. Mr. Flynn? Here. Ms. Goldby? Here. Mr. Heron? Here. Mr. Igo? Here. Mr. Kimbrough? Here. Mr. Cornegay? Mr. Crasher? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Thank you very much. We're going to ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Council Member Golby and then followed by a moment of silence. And particularly today, we'd like to remember um, the city of Las Vegas and the families um, and friends of those whose lives were lost um, and injured um, in that city this morning. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. You may be seated. At this time, we will begin our public comment period um, where members of the public have the opportunity to speak on a subject of their choice for up to five minutes. We have eight speakers that are scheduled to speak this evening, and I'm going to ask the clerk if he would please call the first speaker. Ms. Nancy Benedict. The first thing I want to say, I'm Nancy Benedict. I live at 31 Forest Road in Delmar. The first thing I want to say is that the TV studio for Channel Albany has been closed for much too long. The last day it was in operation was May 31st. It has four months now it has been closed. Um, this has been going on much too long. The PEG Oversight Committee had better get busy and get the channel operating, the TV studio operating again. It is being, the, well, the, the studio, the, the channel is not gone blank. I mean, it, it does have programs on, but an awful lot of them are very old programs and there are no shows being made in the TV studio. I think that's terrible. It's been, it's gone on much too long. The other thing I would like to talk about is the um, ordinance uh, that would uh, reduce the amount of time people have to shovel their snow. Um, they would not have and a warning after the initial 24 hours, which, which uh, a homeowner or a business owner is allowed to shovel snow. I think that's a good thing. I think uh, about 48 hours or more is much too long to allow people to shovel snow on their sidewalk. And, and because I represent Citizens for Public Transportation, which is a group, which is a group committed to getting better uh, bus service. Uh, I think this is a very important thing for people who have to walk from their home to the bus uh, stop or a per person who takes the bus in from outside the city and then has to walk to wherever they're going uh, from, from a bus stop. Uh, it's, it's much better to have the uh, sidewalk shoveled than to have to walk through snow that has not been shoveled. However, 
if you want to have really accessible bus stops, there's a lot of other things that the city has to do before, um, besides uh, besides requiring that the bus uh, that the uh, sidewalks be shoveled um, more more timely and that uh, one thing is that you should should uh, start ticketing cars for parking and and bus stops so that they would be able to clear the um, so they would be able to plow out do a better job of plowing out the bus stops uh, the area for the way it works now is that the uh, CDTA is responsible for shoveling out the bus shelter. Then the sidewalk is the responsibility of the homeowner or the business owner uh, who, uh, to, and who, who uh, is, has a place in back of the sidewalk to keep that shoveled. But the area between the sidewalk and the curb is a no man's land that nobody is really responsible to shovel. And that's terrible because that's where the big snowbank usually is. Uh, the other thing is there often are little ridges of snow uh, between the curb and the place where people board the buses. And that really should be addressed by the city also. So I think the city really has some other issues besides um, Besides the sidewalk, which is an important issue too uh, for bus riders, but they also ought to look at some of the other issues regarding safe and accessible bus stops. Thank you. Dennis Carries. Thank you, Dennis Carius, and I agree with Nancy, what she said uh, regarding the PEG oversight, public access, education, and government, three channels. I actually like channels 16, 17, and 18, which is those three channels, more than channel 6, 10, and 13. And I really would like them to go in a good direction, but unfortunately, there are some that are doing just the opposite. So I'm just asking if we can get those to go in a good direction because for four months, over four months, the studio has been closed. And there is no reason, if that ever happened with CBS, ABC, NBC, that wouldn't go for more than you know hours. We're not talking days, weeks, or months, but here we're talking over four months, the studio was closed because one coordinator has not been replaced and there's nothing hard about doing that. So I would like the chair of the PEG Oversight Board to be someone who would want that board to go in a good direction. And the person who can do that, he's actually here today, is the vice chair of that PEG Oversight Board, Mark Gronich. And he could really get that to go in a good direction. So could we please just reform things if they ever get dysfunctional. Thank you. Our next speaker. Michael Connors. Good evening, Madam President, members of the council, um, citizens. My name is Michael F. Connors II. I live at 16 Circle Lane in Albany, 12203, in Mr. Igo's district. Uh, I am the Albany County Comptroller. Our office did a study and has been working on this for about three years with the Benjamin Institute. And this essentially is looking at the point ones all the way through to uh, every city, town, and village in the county. There are approximately 5,800 full-time employees in those 20 local governments. When you look at that detail, uh, in the last three years of the detail, you'll see uh, that we've gone up roughly 2.3% per year. And a lot of that is due to step increases rather than just straight out raises. 
If you carry that trend forward for 10 years, the combined increase of uh, payroll, fringe expenses for uh, the point one employees will increase by $192 million. We looked at the county's numbers for the last 10 years and there's a chart in there for that. Albany County has actually had a decline in the number of employees in Albany County. And if you go back to 2011 on the chart and you look at the decline, you'll see it's, you know, it's going down uh, rather, rather significantly over that period of time. The difficulty though is that we've been slammed just as you have and everyone else has uh, by our retirement costs and our health insurance costs. So when you look at that trend for us, uh, it's an Excuse me, what are we looking at? Because I don't have it. Oh, you guys have that? I have yours. Madam President, I have yours. I thought, oh, hold on a second. Did that lose my time? Hmm. Nobody up here has it, so. If you, if you look at the charts, if you look at the charts, when you look at the county's uh, projected for 10 years, uh, there's a rather, uh, there's been a rather significant increase in what our fringe costs have been. So even though we've cut really over that 10 year period of time, several hundred employees, the overall cost in just the last five years have gone up by $27 million. When you look at this level that we're on, it's clearly a not sustainable level. So this is the first point of the presentation that's in there. The second point of that presentation is that we face in Albany County, all of us, a much greater risk of loss of revenue from sales tax occurring, sales, sales occurring on the internet. In our analysis, we have at least 27.9% of our sales tax revenue comes from non-residents, and that's a very conservative number. Uh, you could really push for the number to be 30, but we like to use a conservative number. When you look at what that potential loss is, for all of us, it's roughly $72 million. And you might say, well, gee, that's not going to happen. It's not all going to happen. But we have, as a county, the second largest percentage of non-resident sales tax income in the state of New York. Uh, Nassau County has the largest. So the simple example is someone bought a pair of sneakers at Crossgates for $100. The sales tax was $8. $4 goes to the state of New York. $4 goes to the county, we keep 240 and you and the cities, towns, villages in the county split up the other $1.60 based upon population. There's some little variances in the six uh, villages with how their agreement goes with their counties, but uh, their towns, but th that's how that works. That money is not going to be there. We've seen a drop in the last uh, two decades from 35% down to 27.9. You've got an increase in shopping that's occurring at exit 15 on the Northway, and now, of course, in Route 4 in Rensselaer County. So you can see that happening. In our budget, in the county's budget, our total federal aid and state aid combined is about $15 million less than our sales tax. And I think in Albany, I think you get something like $33 million, so it's, you're, you're not in a jeopardy. But if you look at the town of Gilberland, their income from property taxes is about $4 million, 3.7 I believe it is. If you look at what they're getting on sales tax, it's almost 12 million. If you had a 10% reduction in what the sales tax revenue is in Gilliland, you've got a catastrophe for your budget as far as keeping up with that. And we think that by bringing this information to all of the 19 local governments in the county, that it's gonna help all of us as we plan to move forward. Uh, the final point is that there's a tool that we've developed in conjunction with the Benjamin Center in New Falls. That tool will help you track every single member and their job and their salaries and uh, what, you know, roughly the ideas that you have. The nice thing about it, as a research institution, New Falls has the data with the information and identifiers. None of us can see those identifiers, so none of us will really know who any of these people are. Their privacy is protected. But you'll be able to see uh, this information at a granular level about how many equipment operator ones there are adjacent to you. Uh, and it'll go actually in the future years, this, as this report is updated each August, it'll show you where these people are. So as we plan together, I think that there's an opportunity for us to deal with this crisis, 
But if we don't plan together and if we don't continue the good things that we're doing now, uh, we're going to go off a fiscal cliff. Madam President, my apologies for not having that up on the desk. Uh, I can see it clearly left them on the floor. But uh, I do appreciate this time. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Connors. Our next speaker. Alana Klein. Good evening, Madam President and members of the Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment to honor the 58 killed and 500 plus wounded in Las Vegas by asking the Council to continue pressing forward to make sure nothing like that ever happens in our city. I would like to tell you about an interaction that I had with police officers which happened in the last week. I came across a dog in a trapped car in the parking lot of a retail establishment. The temperature at the time was 89 degrees. Even though the person came out, got in their car, and left before I had a chance to call the police, I still called and explained the situation. I was given the same old tired question, were the windows down? Studies show that that has little to no statistical effect on the temperature of the interior of the vehicle. I was told there was nothing that could be done even though I had photographic evidence of both the dog and the license plate, which is the same logic behind traffic cameras and people who don't stop for school buses and emergency vehicles. Additionally, all the law says about animals in locked cars is, quote, extreme heat or cold without proper ventilation or other protection where confinement places companion animal in imminent danger of death or serious injury due to exposure. This is very ambiguous terminology that one could argue makes the law objectively unenforceable. Perhaps more shockingly is the fact that the laws about leaving a child alone in the vehicle are just as generic. The officer told me that I had no idea how long the dog had been in the car, which is a weird thing to say to me because that was my entire point. Upon receiving what I can only describe as an apathetic response, I knew that I had to come before you about this issue. I have received ho-hum attitudes before, but this one crossed the line. The officer told me there was nothing enforceable in this situation. Then the following exchange occurred. Me, so if you knew a child had been abused, but showed no bruises, you wouldn't look into the situation? Officer, how was the dog abused? Me, the car was 90 degrees. In the span of 10 to 15 minutes, the temperature in that car can reach 105 to 110 degrees. Officer, well, it's not like the car was 150 degrees. Let me repeat that. It's not like the car was 150 degrees. I've been to Iraq. I know what 130 degrees feels like without air conditioning and without cold water. If this officer wants to sit around in a car that's 150 degrees, he's more than welcome to. As a matter of fact, I wish I had this officer's name and badge number because I would say them publicly right here in front of you in, of this council without giving a care about proper protocol or whatever it's called. If, anything, if anyone doesn't think this is a big deal, I challenge you to sit in a car on a hot day with a bottle of four ounces of warm, disgusting water. You are not allowed to leave the car and you are not allowed to know when or if someone is coming back. You are not allowed to roll down the window. You do not have the means to start the car. If anyone wants to take this challenge, I am publicly saying that I will sit right there beside you to see whether or not you think it's inhumane. Moreover, to go back to my assertion of apathy, I saw no less than four police vehicles on routine patrol come within a quarter mile of the scene in about 20 minutes. It's not that they couldn't respond to a citizen complaint, it's that they didn't care. This law needs to change. There needs to be, at the minimum, set exact temperature, humidity, and general weather standards for enforcing this law. What I would prefer, however, is a law that simply states that it is illegal to leave an animal in a car, period. Additionally, there are a handful of states that protect good Samaritans from civil liability if they commit an act such as breaking a car's window in order to rescue an animal or a child. I think New York, or at the very least Albany, should join these ranks. And one last tidbit about the story. The license plate of the vehicle I mentioned was that of a New York State Assembly member. That is the level of apathy we're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Our next speaker, please. Jason Mumford. I'm 
going to have to do the auctioneer thing just one more time. Let me connect some dots about the optics of Albany budgeting. August 30th, the Times Union had an article, Albany's economy gets high rankings, and they said the share of young professionals here ranked highest out of 24 legacy cities at 8%. We were second in job performance from 2000 to 2014, and fifth overall out of those 24 legacy cities. But then, September 26th, there's a Times Union article, parts of the capital region missed out on economic recovery. Distressed areas have more housing vacancies and fewer stores. Data looked at adults without high school diplomas, poverty rate, prime age adults not working, housing vacancy rates, median income ratios, changes in employment, and noted that two of the three worst, or I should say least, prosperous zip codes included 12202 and 12207. That's wards two, three, and four. It also noted that pollution sites tended to be in distressed areas. For example, there was a September 22nd article about the energy plant going into Sheridan Avenue, perhaps, that seemed to want forgiveness instead of permission to be built. Anyway, these articles are painting some interesting pictures of our city, but I would like to put some context around that. In 2010, Kathy Sheehan became Albany's treasurer and chief fiscal officer, and in 2014 became the 75th mayor. May 10th, 2014, Times Union reported uh, an article, Albany Mayor Kathy Sheehan read like cams about safety, in which he adamantly stated, for me, it's a public safety issue. This is not a revenue-driven decision at all. But on October 14th, she's being interviewed for WRGB, and reporter Kimberly Howard said that Mayor Kathy Sheehan factored the red light camera revenue into the budget for 2015 proposal, even though it hadn't yet passed the Common Council to be approved. Mayor Sheehan, in the same interview, said that including revenue from the people who choose not to follow the law and run red lights seemed a better use of resources than having to further cut jobs in the city. Well, when you budget an unhatched chicken like that, it is very much about the budget, uh, about the money, no matter what you happen to say on the campaign trail. Now let me add one more article, Analysis Albany's Budget Hangs on a $12.5 million Leap of Faith. She likened the need for the state to cough up that money, saying that the equivalent, if we didn't get that money, would be a 22% tax increase on property owners that they cannot and should not have to shoulder. It's interesting, though. That article is not from this year. It's from 2015, two years to the date, in fact. Mayor Sheehan seems to be manufacturing these fiscal crises instead of properly budgeting the resources we actually do have. It, in the same article, it was reported that the State Financial Restructuring Board, FRB, granted Albany only $5 million, including four, about $4 million for operating expenses. And quote, that was on top of $15 million in lieu of taxes for the Empire State Plaza and commitment from the state to buy more than 300 acres of idle land in Queemans uh, ticketed to house a new city landfill. Also said by E.J. McMahon, president of Empire State for Public Policy, was, quote, it's sobering to realize that if Albany does get a recurring commitment of $12 million a year from the state, it will remain fiscally crippled and hobbled economically by a non-competitive tax structure. So here we are, nearing the end of 2017, still in trouble with real crises, sales tax, retirement, blooming health concerns, etc. But the traffic light cameras, which were, quote, all about safety, were somehow budgeted to save jobs, and then no revenue occurred. One data source says that we're the vibrant city, ranked fifth out of 24 legacy cities. But let me not sugarcoat this. A legacy city is actually code word for cities crumbling out of the industrial age and not quite yet modernized. This is not a laurel to rest upon. Again, we're relying on luck. The other recent data source says that we have two of the three worst zip codes in the state vis-a-vis -vis an economic recovery since the crash in 2007. Clearly, we weren't even that lucky all the time. Jeopardy itself used us as the exemplar of urban blight in 2012. At, uh, Kathy Sheehan says that we are a city of neighborhoods. This is practically her slogan, but some of those neighborhoods are obviously still very much at risk. It's almost as if she's gone around saying all neighborhoods matter, when clearly we see that some neighborhoods need to matter more. Furthermore, all the neighbors didn't even matter when she gambled them with the state FRB, risking a possible 22 tax increase for every homeowner just to fill an annual budgetary gap that she helped to fabricate with the traffic cams. And even if that bet is won, the Economic Center for Public Policy says it will be fiscally crippled. And what are we doing with our expiring landfill? Instead of capitalizing on that Quayman's property as committed for state purchase or potentially a new landfill site, we intend to offer it as a non-competitive bid. We spoke on that last meeting. And so it smells like she's selling the palace all over again or creating some other crisis and demanding swift knee-jerk responses without time for us to properly think about them. Or was that rezone Albany? Or is it the traffic cams again? 
You know, I remember back in the 1990s, Long Island communities almost uniformly raised taxes around 30%. Almost all discretionary income dried up, businesses closed, unemployment soared, budgets tightened, programs were slashed, people suffered. And yet here we are now poised to re-elect a mayor that wants to make this exact bet with our livelihoods when we can barely afford status quo. She personally spent more on her election campaign than she's likely to recover in salary after taxes, and why is that to keep hiding the inconsistencies in the logic of her budgeting process? This citizen thinks very much so, and it would be shameful if this council, with its current members, or with these soon elected members, continue to rubber stamp <coughs> Michigan's policies and budgets out of expedience. You represent the citizens of Albany. You don't represent the mayor's office. In fact, I'm surprised that Channel Albany hasn't been broadcasting this outrage all over Albany. <coughs> oh, right, that's yet one more fiasco Albany faces. Mr. Mumford, I'm going to have to ask you to tie this up. I have two sentences left, thank you. Please, for the sake of us citizens, start actually improving your pushback on any manufactured crises to deal with the ones we actually have. Stand up to demand better of Sheehan's typical budgetary games before our luck runs out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, please. Mr. Raguso. Good evening. My name is Vince Raguso. I live at 13 Beach Avenue, Albany, New York. I come before you today, it was a pretty sad day. We had 60 killings in Vegas and 552 wounded people. Come here today to the Common Council. I hear Mike Connors talk about the fate of the county. This morning, I listened to Mayor Sheen talk about increasing the taxes again in the city of Albany. I don't, I don't know how much more that the citizens of Albany can take. If you look at it, we had a school increase, we had a trash increase, and now a tax of property tax increase. And the same council here talks about affordable housing. Well, how do I get that? Tell me, how do I get that? If I had the answer, I wouldn't be here in front of you asking. You, this council here will get every agency in the city of Albany, and you will go over their budget with them. And I ask you to look at that budget very closely and take out everything you can to keep this a zero budget increase. I, I just, every year we just continue to increase. Last year was trash. So how do we, how do we again, how do we, re, how do we maintain affordable housing? I don't believe we can. And every time the taxes get increased, I see more and more people leave the city. I hope, and keep in mind, that the mayor is the introducer of the budget, but this council, passes that budget. This is your budget, not the mayor's budget. So again, I ask you to go over the budget very carefully with the agency heads and make sure all the fat is out of the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raguso. Our next speaker. Brian Marco O'Malley. Good evening, I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you tonight and I'm here to speak in support of Alderman Goldby's proposal to eliminate the second 24 hour waiting period for snow removal before a fine can be assessed and the snow cleared. This proposal is one that just makes sense in that it dramatically improves the quality of life for residents, improves the walkability of our city and perhaps most importantly bring includes measures to bring us into compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act by requiring that sidewalks be cleared to ADA, ADA guidelines. To provide a little perspective, I spend my days working on a Medicaid program intended to help people with disabilities stay in their homes. People utilize this service to live productive lives in their communities 
oftentimes successfully gaining employment because they are able to have staff come into their homes and perform tasks such as helping them dress, prepare food, and more. The strengths of this program disappear when sidewalks are not adequately shoveled. Previously, vibrant individuals are forced to either remain homebound or put themselves at risk, moving into a street at a time when that street is already narrower than it normally is because of snowbanks gathered on the side of the road. By not only eliminating the second 24-hour notice period, but by requiring the entire sidewalk be clear, we are taking steps to make sure that those with disabilities can navigate the streets year round. I want to be completely clear. I'm not here to advocate for this because it's a nice or feel good measure. This is a basic civil right and amounts to equal treatment under the law. None of you would be expected, none of you would expect to be shut in your house for 48 hours after a storm and neither should somebody in a wheelchair. Additionally, I have lived in the city of Albany for 19 years, which amounts to all of my adult life and longer than any place I've lived anywhere. I've lived downtown and uptown. I lived on Lark Street for eight years and I shoveled my sidewalk as a renter. I lived on Jefferson between Dove and Delaware for nine years and I shoveled my walkway as a homeowner. Now I live at 90 Homestead Ave and I have a ranch which is about double the length of sidewalk, and I shovel my sidewalk repeatedly. This is what you do as a responsible homeowner in a civil society. You make sure that people can get through. It is refreshing in the winter when you're shut in for so long to be able to get outside and walk. But when properties are unsho unshoveled, it not only makes it unpleasant and difficult, it makes it dangerous. Some landlords plow their driveways into large piles that block the sidewalk. These piles must be scaled precariously, hoping you don't fall through the pile or off of it. Unshoveled walks quickly melt, then refreeze, turning them into icy paths that are made even more dangerous by the uneven terrain from frozen footprints. Basically, irresponsible businesses and homeowners, and that is who we are talking about, ruin one of the prime assets of the city, its walkability, and instead create a dangerous situation for all of us. Finally, it must be clear that even if we eliminate the second 24-hour notice period, Albany will still have one of the longest periods in the state to shovel a walk. In Buffalo, sidewalks must be cleared by 9 a.m. without regard to when the snow stopped. If snow ceases at 8 a.m., you have one hour to clear your walk. In Allegheny, according to the Times Union story on this bill, snow must be cleared within three hours of the start of snowfall and then maintained throughout the storm. In Colony, our neighbor, they place one 24-hour window just like we do without the need for a second window and people manage to clear their sidewalks. Imagine if you would, in a snow emergency, if cars were told at eight o'clock that they had 24 hours to move their car after the snow emergency. This system not only wouldn't work, it couldn't work. We wouldn't do this because we need to be able to drive on our streets. We also need to be able to walk on our sidewalks. This is a, why I live in the city of Albany for walkable sidewalks, so I can walk to restaurants, walk to the library, walk my dog, go out and walk with my kids. I hope that we can extend this right and finally do something to improve the walkability of this city in winter for everyone, people with disabilities, seniors, and the other residents throughout the city that like to go for a walk. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker. Mark Gronick. Good evening, my name is Mark Gronich. I live at 300 Hackett Boulevard in Albany. And uh, thank you, Madam President. It's good to see you again and all my friends on the Common Council. Uh, I just wanted to, I'm 
I was sitting in the audience thinking of so many things that I wanted to say, and I hear everyone talking about the snow removal thing. I'd tell you one story of what happened to me. There was a DGS uh, snow removal the drug that was blowing the snow onto everyone's uh, lawn, and they blew it onto my sidewalk instead. There was a big pile of snow that couldn't be removed. It turned into ice quickly. The, they put a sticker on my house that said, you got 24 hours to remove it or we're going to remove it. The DGS people put it there. I called the media. They had three camera crews waiting for these guys at DGS to come, uh, uh, to come and uh, you know, do their thing, and I didn't know how much they were going to charge me. I tell you, once the cameras were there, they didn't, the guy didn't get out of his car. I was standing, I'm not a light guy, I was standing on top of the snow, the ice, and doing the interview with the TV cameras. There's got to be something written into the legislation that protects the residents from unintended consequences that DGS creates themselves that the residents should not be fined when they create the problem. Okay, that's one thing I didn't expect to talk about that, but I hope that it gets through. I wanted to let you all know that I sent you this uh, JPEG of this article that I wrote in the Association of Towns about uh, cutting the cable cord. Uh, revenues are decreasing all over the uh, state for regarding uh, people who are using non-wired video distribution systems and uh, the cable franchise fees are going down, down, down and eventually it's going to lead to a budget hole and uh, you know you talk about what the situation we're facing here in Albany it's not so, it's that first of all the PEG uh, seven years ago when it was started the uh, the PEG Access Oversight Board might have been an appropriate title. Seven years later, it's not an appropriate title. It's got to be more than an oversight board. It hasn't worked as an oversight board. Plus, the people who are on the board don't really want to be there. We have five of the 11 members who are called stakeholders, and they are doing this out of obligation, one, one member says it's a conflict of interest for him to be there, he never shows up. One, the school district is supposed to support us with interns and, and some of the high school students from Brooklyn, they don't do that. The, the uh, representative is busier than a one on paper hanger, you know, he's just going along, getting along and that's it. Uh, he's got a very important job, he's very busy. You know, and then we have the new school of contemporary uh, media, or uh, and they are a profit-making organization. They helped us a lot in the beginning. They're based in Colony now. They don't. They shouldn't be on the board. This board needs to be restructured. We don't need the stakeholders on the board. Plus, we have people who are appointed who don't really have a background in media and they don't come to the channel, they don't come to the studio to look to see what the equipment is all about and what the challenges are that we're facing. So I really would, it's not so much whether we're uh, up and running, not up and running, we have a schedule, we don't have a schedule. We, I think this legislation really has to be re-examined and redone and we need to start fresh in 2018. With a, with a whole new idea, a whole new concept. We still don't have policies and procedures in place. We never had bylaws. This whole thing is just, it, it, forget the, about the oath of office that all of you are supposed to reauthorize the members of the PEG board who are common council appointees. I mean, that's just taking too long in and of itself. But we really have to have some critical a, a critical look into this. You're all very smart. You all understand what this is all about. You've, a lot of you, uh, more of you have been to the studio than the board members have. I mean, I, I just, if they had the passion, they would be there, they would be concerned, they would be jumping up and down. They don't have a passion for this. And I really believe that they were the, uh, there's a book called From Good to Great by uh, Jim Collins that you gotta have the right people in the right seats in the right bus at the right time. 
This board does not have that. And I would ask you to please re-examine that. Am I done with my time? Okay. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I did have more to say, but please, you know, uh, call upon me if you need any more advice. Feel thank free you. to come back in two weeks. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Gromich. That concludes our public comment period. We got a little static here or um, vibration. Can I? Thank you. Thank you very much um, for all the members of the public who came to speak today. And that concludes our public comment period. We'll now move to approval of minutes from our previous meeting. Mr. Conte. Thank you, Madam President. I move the approval of the minutes for the September 18 meeting. Thank you. Was there a second? All those in favor? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Conti. Thank you, Madam President. Local laws on tonight's agenda are held. Thank you. Are there any reports of standing committees? Mr. Igo. Number C. There you go. Madam President, the Law, Buildings, and Codes Committee meeting met last Tuesday, the 26th, and took up uh, Ms. Goldby's ordinance. 389117. It was reported out of the committee with a favorable recommendation unanimously. Thank you. I'm sure you'll hear an explanation of it from her. Thank you. Mr. Herring. Yes, Madam President, the uh, Planning, Economic Development, and Land Use Committee will be meeting tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, October 3rd, for the discussions on Ordinance Number 399217, which is the rights of way franchise with Extend Net. Um, which is the installation of telecommunications equipment on uh, telephone poles. Is there anyone else? I see a hand over here. Ms. Doshate. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just want to announce that uh, the Budget Committee, Budget uh, Finance, Ta Taxation, and Assessment Committee, uh, we've uh, scheduled meetings uh, throughout the month of October and into November for um, uh, departmental presentations, unit presentations. The first meeting uh, will be uh, next Wednesday, directly after caucus, and that is when the budget office is going to do an overall presentation and questions and answers on the proposed budget. And then uh, we have a meeting on Thursday with the IT unit and uh, Albany Community Development Agency. And then each of the following uh, two weeks, we have three meetings. Um, each of the following three me weeks, we have three meetings. And then we will be uh, discussing the budget as part of the uh, full council uh, following that. Do you have any more of those um, hard copy schedules? Yes. I would appreciate an extra one. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Mr. Players? Thank you, Madam President. Um, I mentioned during our last meeting that we have a PEG ad hoc committee meeting schedule, so I just wanted to reiterate that it's scheduled for October 19th, and it's open to any council uh, colleague who would like to be in attendance, the purpose of that meeting is to discuss the individual appointments of all of the council appointees on the PEG oversight body. The entire board has been invited to attend that meeting, so we will also be hearing from um, non-council appointees uh, during that meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's no other reports. We'll now move to consideration of ordinances, Mr. Conte. Thank you, Madam President. The ordinances on tonight's agenda are held with the exception of agenda item number eight. Eight. Just eight. Okay, uh, what about? I'm sorry, thank you, Ms. Goldby. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. I notice ordinance 389117 as amended and request passage on a roll call vote thereon. Clerk, please read the title. An ordinance 
amending Article 1 of Chapter 323, Streets and Sidewalks of the City of Albany, of the, pardon me, of the Code of the City of Albany. Is there any discussion? Ms. Goldby? Thank you, Madam President. Um, so this ordinance, I just want to brief, very briefly go over what this ordinance does and, and doesn't do. So um, all property owners still have 24 hours to clear their sidewalks of snow and ice after the snow stops. That does not change with this ordinance. What does change with this ordinance is that it removes the language that requires the city to post properties after a complaint has been made. And in most cases, complaints don't get made immediately after 24 hours after the snow stops. It can be one day, two days, it can be a week or two in some cases um, before DGS actually receives the complaint and then they need to go out and post the property, um, provide that property owner with 24 hour notification before the city takes any action. Um, and then they have to go back and check again to see whether or not it was complied with uh, before they do take action. And so what this does is prolong mobility issues for anybody who uses our sidewalks. That means people in wheelchairs, that means children, parents with strollers, um, our senior citizens. And, um, and so this is one important step that we need to take to increase mobility in the snowy months in the city of Albany. I do recognize that it is not the only issue that needs to be addressed, but this is the issue, this is an issue that can be addressed legislatively, um, whereas the other issues that we've heard um, tonight and other times when the Common Council has discussed snow issues in the city um, are issues of uh, plows, pl plowing in um, crosswalks and driveways and, um, you know, and um, even putting snow back onto the sidewalk. Those are all problems that do occur, um, but they can be addressed procedurally. What this ordinance does is address a problem with our city code that hinders mobility in our city. Um, and so with that, I do um, ask for your support on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fahey. Oh, thank you, Madam President. I, should, I, I want to commend Councilmember Golby on bringing this legislation forward. Uh, really, in my mind, it's, uh, it's amazing that it's taken us this long to address this situation. Um, so uh, you have my full support on this. Um, uh, it, I can't tell you how many winters I've, I've gone through here as a council member receiving many, many calls about uh, unshoveled sidewalks. And, and to me, this, this really signals a an important change. Uh, we're setting a standard here that it that people deserved to be able to walk down their block without slipping and falling. And um, uh, we're putting the onus on the uh, the, uh, the the property owner, uh, the the residents, to make sure they get their sidewalks cleared. Uh, yes, there are going to be people who have difficulty clearing their sidewalks. I think we all should, uh, the city should accept that responsibility uh, to come up with ways to assist individuals who are, who are for certain going to have trouble with this. Um, but I think it's uh, essential. Those, those are often the same folks who can't get down the street. So, um, uh, but I, th I, I think this, it, this is, this, is, this legislation is very much overdue, um, and I think it's a, a, a great improvement, 
And as somebody said earlier, there's, there's uh, municipalities that have an even shorter window. So um, again, thank you for bringing this legislation forth. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Madam President, Mr. Just, just for information, the mayor's office is uh, trying to put together a list of uh, volunteers, church groups, etc. If anybody knows any, contact them that might be willing to help out seniors. We know that is a problem for a lot of seniors. So if anybody here does have anything or any group like that, please let them know. And the other thing is trying to get the word out that this is effective December 1st of this year. So they are going to uh, send out some, I think with the uh, we have one water bill left this year. They're going to try to send out an educational piece on it. So everybody should look forward to that. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Robinson? I find this to be terrible. I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. This piece of legislation will be a good thing if it was dealing with equitable across the board. The purpose of this legislation is to provide pedestrian safety. But let's take a look at all parties that's involved. We have the homeowner who most of my colleagues sat up here and spoke about. I definitely agree that snow should automatically be removed, removed 24 hours after snowstorm. I am not in disagreement with that. But there you have the city. When you have a constituent set up and spoke about the city plowing a pal three feet high where he couldn't um, address. And when he called the city, um, nothing materialized at that point. Then we have the county, right? The county land bank owns 85% of vacant and abandoned property and land in lower wards. But as you go on and read the legislation, it says that the commissioner shall propagate rules and gather complaints, and he should deploy the necessary personnel to investigate the complaint. If such complaints is bought, against the county, the state, or federal entity, that entity should be notified of that complaint and urge declare the sidewalks as soon as possible. Not giving them a directive that they must remove the snow as they given a directive to an average homeowner within 24 hours to remove the snow. So if I get up after a snowstorm and I remove my snow within 24 hours, but I have a vacant building to the left of me and vacant land to the right of me, and the city come down because now the legislation is broad. Maybe because the uh, current administration may want to increase their profits during snow shoveling, and they deploy their workers to go down from the top of First Street to the end of First Street after 24 hours and just shovel every property's own, every property from, from the from the top of first to the bottom of Clinton Avenue and build a peat and, and build a residence in the homeowners. But here it is, you you dealing with homeowners that you're given a 24-hour um, grace period, but you're not dealing with a, 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 a county entity that has 85% of blight and, and land in certain communities. Now and I sat at a committee meeting. And one of my colleagues, he made it jokingly. You know, well, I don't have to worry about that because I don't have sidewalks in my neighborhood. So again, let's deal with the equitable. Where are these, where are these forces is gonna be deployed once this law is implemented? I mean, on a good day, I will sit up here and I will say, yes, vote for this because I believe that snow should be removed as soon as possible. But it's not equitable because you're only dealing with homeowners. You're not dealing with the state. You're not dealing with the county. And you're not dealing with federal entities that have property in the city of Albany. So this is not an equitable bill, and I will not be voting for it. Thank you, 
Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate the words of Council Member Mark Robinson. He uh, pretty much hit the nail on the head. There are a few points that I did want to bring up and concerns that I had. Uh, the first concern is sort of this half-truth, which is that the 24-hour notice doesn't go away. Um, that's not entirely true. So there are many instances uh, where a sidewalk would be covered in either snow or ice. Um, it's not just after a snowfall. So for example, if there is a thawing during the day and a rethawing uh, during the evening, that can cause uh, ice buildup on a sidewalk. This legislation doesn't properly address that. So that actually in this in that situation, that 24-hour grace period, as I understand the legislation, uh, wouldn't apply. It would be an immediate fine if the person did not clear the sidewalk. Also, uh, I do have a concern when speaking with residents, particularly uh, those who are disabled themselves and seniors. I had a conversation with uh, two residents who own a home in the West End. Uh, one is blind, the other is severely disabled physically and some mental, uh, channel, mental disabilities as well. Uh, I asked them about this piece of legislation in particular and it says it takes them time for their family members to help them out. Um, a comment was made during public comment that this is civil society and we plow our, uh, we take care of our sidewalks. Yeah, we do. Uh, but the people who were disabled in my ward uh, who can't do that uh, and do need a little bit of extra time, uh, they're not uncivilized people. Um, they're trying to get by too. Uh, I also agree, and it needs to be um, reaffirmed what Councilmember Robinson said uh, with respect to where uh, this is going to be uh, enforced. And I, I gotta say, I do find it awfully ironic that we do talk about uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act in this uh, piece of legislation. Uh, I do find that ironic on one point because when you look through the rules uh, promulgated by that, uh, nowhere does it talk about a 24-hour notice period at all, so I'm not quite sure uh, the point of that in the legislation. And also, and more importantly, the city is in gross uh, in adherence to the Americans with Disabilities Act in a host of ways. It's very difficult for me to go to a constituent and let them know about this new, uh, if this does pass, uh, this new uh, time period to remove snow when we clearly do not have our act together as a city, as was mentioned with DGS, when it com comes to clearing our streets. So um, if an individual that, uh, clears their sidewalk, uh, I know that in this past snowstorm we had in March, there were streets all over the 11th Ward that were impassable for days, clearly a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I know the point was made that there are procedures that can be changed in DGS to address these concerns, but I have not seen any of those procedure changes that would make me feel comfortable to make it fair for the residents to make such a change. So I think it's entirely reasonable to have this in place, um, and uh, I think uh, it's important that we look out for those individuals that may struggle in situations particularly and the severely cold, uh, dangerous weather that can occur uh, in this part of the country, uh, and to force uh, a senior, somebody with a disability, out sooner than they really need to be, uh, that's just not something I'm comfortable with. And until we address the inequities that exist in our own house, uh, I'm not going to start adding additional burdens to uh, homeowners at this time. I'll be voting no. Thank you, Mr. Crash and Mr. Conti. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I just want to uh, address a couple of issues in terms of what this ordinance does. Um, it, it really doesn't change the process. Um, it doesn't add any new exemptions in. Um, all it does, the, the currently, uh, under current law, you are required to have your sidewalk cleared of snow and ice within 24 hours of cessation of a snowfall. That is the key requirement in current law. Um, that is what this maintains. There is that other provision that DGS can clear if you're not in compliance, but first they have to go and do an inspection and if they determine that you're in violation, then they have to post a violation uh, and give you another 24 hours. 
uh, and then they have to come back after that to see whether or not you've complied before they can correct the situation. Um, we talk about that being a minimum of 48 hours, uh, but you know, in terms of timing, it can be a lot longer than that in, uh, in days, et cetera. Um, once, you know, once you have, uh, the, the current requirement is that the 24 hours, that's the time frame within which you need to, to operate. Uh, the, the additional 48 hours is just delays and delays and delays. Let me just be also clear, current law already provides uh, that in the case of a county, state, or federal entity, uh, that notification is provided and that they should correct the situation promptly. That's current law. We're not making any changes there at, at all. That we're not touching that part. Um, I want to go back also in terms of the issue of uh, violations and penalties uh, and what happens. And I want to also quickly call your attention to uh, subparagraph uh, B, uh, which is in, in the ordinance here, uh, section 322-22. Um, again, no costs assessed herein shall be added to the tax bill, nor shall any legal action be instituted by the city, um, et cetera, unless the, uh, the owner is afforded an opportunity to be heard at a hearing convened by the commissioner. And let me very clearly, and also states, a defense to any action instituted by the city as herein provided shall be the physical impairment of the owner or occupant. So there is already an automatic defense that is designed to uh, address issues uh, and protect seniors and people with disabilities uh, in terms of their inability to comply. But the ordinance itself is being introduced in the modification actually to address concerns that seniors and people have with disabilities have in terms of mobility. Uh, and that's what we're hearing from, that's what I hear from, from my constituents. I did put this ordinance out to my constituents to get feedback. Um, there are, yes, we always have the concerns coming back about, you know, trying to find people who can help, et cetera. I'm glad to hear the mayor's office is working on that. Um, there are really good programs and uh, examples out there that can be looked at. Uh, to uh, take care of that. Um, but m the response I got was very positive. Um, this is still going to be a complaint-driven system. We're not going to have, I mean, you know, DGS's first responsibility in a snowstorm is to make sure that the, uh, the uh, roadways are open and accessible. Um, in terms of uh, sidewalk clearance, uh, they're predominantly going to respond on a complaint-based system uh, you know, in terms of the need uh, to correct uh, inaccessible situations. The ADA provision, by the way, is, even though it's new language, it's something we're already covered by uh, and required uh, to, uh, to comply with. It's not a new requirement, but putting it in here, it is a, it is a clarification. Um, shoveling a path that is this wide, because that's how wide your shovel is, is not ADA compliant. Uh, and I think, you know, people need to understand that. But the ADA clearly deals with issues of you know, accessibility, and one of the guidelines is the public agency must maintain its walkways in an accessible condition with only isolated or temporary interruptions in accessibility. Uh, 28 CFR section 35.31. Part of this maintenance obligation includes reasonable snow removal efforts. So while the ADA does not, and the guidelines do not set a specific time frame and they recognize that there is um, there are isolated or temporary interruption in accessibility because of snow. Uh, and, you know, 24 hours to, to uh, any, anything in excess of 24 hours is not reasonable as far as clearing and making your, your sidewalks accessible uh, under ADA. Um, I think this ordinance is reasonable. Um, I think the December 1st uh, effective date gives us an opportunity to further educate the public and get information out there about the, uh, the requirements um, and, and things that need to be done. Um, it will better deploy city personnel so that we're not wasting personnel in terms of going back to properties several times because they have to post and go back and inspect and go back and forth, et cetera, uh, so that we can promptly deal with these issues and have them dealt with on a more timely basis than we do now. One of the complaints I get, you know, in terms of uh, sidewalks that have not been shoveled are we, you know, people will complain, they'll, they'll uh, you know, 
complaint to DGS, they'll file complaints, and it takes an inordinate amount of time for a correction to be made because of the, the lengthy bureaucratic process that we have. Uh, and so streamlining it as this ordinance would do, I think also will help better deploy personnel, et cetera. Um, I, I, I don't think we're gonna be targeting areas. I think we're gonna be focusing on those areas that need to be t dealt with. And again, this is predominantly still gonna be a complaint-based system. That's just, na just the nature of how we deal with a lot of code issues and fines, et cetera. Um, but I think it's, it moves in the right direction. Uh, it is making a, a small change to existing law. It is not uh, adding additional exemptions. Uh, there are already protections in there for seniors and people with disabilities as far as uh, potential for fines. Uh, and we are working to try to find resources for those, that community uh, to better deal with their issues. So I, I support the ordinance. I will be voting in favor of it. And I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conti. Is there anyone else? Mr. Ms. Goldby, and as the sponsor, should be the last speaker, unless there's someone else. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just uh, want to clarify or a, couple of, a couple of things um, that were brought up that Mr. Conti um, may have addressed, but I wasn't certain, and that is specifically the issue of thawing and, um, and then refreezing and how you know that can obstruct a sidewalk, um, and that is correct. The ordinance does take that into account in the in the very first sentence. The current ordinance now does take that into account in the very first sentence when it says, within 24 hours of the sensation of a snowfall and at such other occasions requiring the same. So re at such other occasions requiring the same leads me to believe that other occasions that would require addressing snow and ice built up on a sidewalk. Um, so it is already in there. You have 24 hours after new stuff shows up on your sidewalk, whether it's thawed or a new snowfall. Um, and, and just to reiterate that, that there is a hearing process that's already built in uh, to the system, and so anybody um, can request a hearing. DGS does hold hearings um, where people uh, can, you know, fight their their fines and um, you know and and they do. And this is th I really this is not something to punish people with disabilities. This is not something to punish homeowners. This is simply. Um, something that we need to do so that people can get where they need to go, whether you own a car or you don't own a car. 25% of the people in this city, or probably more at this point, do not own or have access to personal vehicles. They rely on walking, they rely on taking the bus, and we need to take care of everybody in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goldie. Ask the clerk to please call the roll. Ms. Plaris? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Camisso? No. Mr. Conti? Yes. Mr. O'Shea? Yes. Ms. Fahey? Yes. Mr. Flynn? Yes. Ms. Goldie? Yes. Mr. Heron? Yes. Mr. Igo? Yes. Mr. Kimbrough? Yes. Ms. Cornegan? Yes. Go sponsor, please. Mr. Crasher? No. <clears throat> Mr. O'Brien? Yes, go sponsor. Mr. Robinson? No. Mr. 12 affirmative, you're negative. Thank you very much. The, the ordinance passes. Thank you very much. Mr. Conti, we'll move to resolutions introduced. I'm sorry, Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Madam President. I recognize resolution 55101.17R as for its introduction and vote thereon. Please read the title. Resolution of the Common Council authorizing the conveyance of a portion of the Adiarbro Public Housing Project by the Albany Housing Authority to Lumber Street Apartments to Housing Development Fund Corporation as nominee for Adiarbro Phase Two LLC. Is there any discussion? Mr. Robinson. Mm. 
There's a lot of activity going on in the city of Albany. And this Adiyar Borough project, labeled a project, is one big entity of activity that's taking place in the city of Albany. Not only that is taking place in the city of Albany, it's taking place 500 feet from a community where I represent. The project itself, the rendering, is beautiful. But I had conversations during the past three years with Albany Housing. I asked for numbers as far as job creation for inner city from zip codes of 12202, 12204, and 12206. To the date, Albany Housing have not presented me with no numbers where is that opportunity for employment have existed within these, within these areas, within, within these area codes. Um, and I stated earlier in my, in my term that I cannot support projects, right, that do not hire within the community. Because I believe that the community should grow with the project itself. That's how we grow out of poverty. Right now, it's concentrated poverty in the district where I represent. Every day, I hear my constituents say it's lack of opportunity. But when you look down the hill, there's a massive project going on. And Albany Housing has established several LLCs, which was told. In the words of um, the director or the president, Steve Logel, he stated that they are trying to get out of the affordable housing concept and move to a market rate concept. So that being said, you know, we also realize that 50 feet from IDR Bell I mean project, you have a lot of more activity going on. 960 Broadway, the Warehouse District, the Nipper Building. All this is up with, all this is activity. All this is being driven by pallets being driven by IDA given tax breaks and tax incentives to these developers that's coming to our city and build, to our city and our neighborhoods and build. And it's frustrating. And it's, you know, you, you know, you got, you know, here it is, I think you're on phase two of a project. They could probably have a phase three, phase four. And again, you have a lot of activity. You have a lot, a lot, a lot of activity in the city of Albany. But it's not equitable. It's not being, as our mayor says about all neighborhoods is equal and about spreading an equitable agenda, the development in the city of Albany is not an equitable agenda, and that needs to change. So I'll be voting no on this. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If not, please call the roll. Mr. Clarence? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Commisso? Yes. Mr. Conti? Yes. Mr. O'Shea? Yes. Ms. Fahey? Yes. Mr. Flynn? Yes. Ms. Goldby? Yes. Mr. Heron? Yes. Mr. Igo? Yes. Mr. Kimbrough? Yes. Mr. Cornegay? Yes. Mr. Crasher? No. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Robinson? No. It's 13 affirmative, 2 negative. The resolution passes. Mr. Conti? Uh, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to add resolution uh, 56.101.17R to tonight's agenda. Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Please read the title. Ms. Who is it? Who's is Bailey. it? Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Madam President. Please read the title. A resolution authorizing the implementation and funding in the first instance, instance 100% of the federal aid in the state Member Shelley Program A cost of a transportation federal aid project and appropriated funds, therefore, for the Henry Johnson Boulevard Bridge Repair. If not, um, let me see. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. The resolution passes. 
Mr. Trump. Thank you, Madam President. The remaining resolutions on tonight's agenda are held. Thank you. Madam yeah. President, if there's no further business, I move for adjournment. Second. Good evening.